Joe McNally is an internationally acclaimed award-winning photographer. He's captured cover stories and features for the National Geographic, Life, and Sports Illustrated. We're really excited to have him back with us again on Advancing Your Photography. I wanted to dive in kind of where we left off in our last interview. What are some good ways for somebody to learn the language of light? Light obviously is with us every day all around us, you know, has been said many times, I don't lay claim to it at all. It's a language we speak, you know, starting with the very origins of the word photography, the, the Greek root is photographos, which is to write with light. It's a storytelling tool, if you will. There are photographers throughout the years who have, you know, embraced, you know, sumptuous, you know, um, beautiful, like North Light, like Lord Snowden in his studio in, in London. And, and then there's People who use a poppy sort of flashy uh, fashion t style of lighting. I mean, it's as individual to your taste as your pictures in many ways. But one of the first steps you need to take as a photographer, if you're taking camera in hand and trying to go forward in this, is to intuitively try to understand light and what it does uh, and the qualities thereof. And you can, to a degree, I think... Um, get to an understanding of this through certain mechanics, you know, experiment, uh, harsh light, you know, light that's distant from your subject, light that's more diffuse. You also have to be very observant. Uh, look at a lot of photographs, for instance. Look at paintings. You know, there's certain, you know, kind of, of you know, beautiful, rich light that the, that the, you know, for instance, the Flemish painters used. What you have to understand, it's not just good light. Oh, that's good light. It has impact because it conveys a psychological message to your, the viewer of your photograph. I always encourage people to place very human adjectives or descriptors on light. I, I say to a class sometimes if I'm teaching, I'm like, well, light can be, um, it can be angry. It can be harsh. It can be slashing. It can be gentle. It can be provocative. It can be sumptuous. It can be baroque. It can be sultry. It can be all these things that you would, you know, see in your average sort of, you know, steamy romance novel, if you will, you know. Uh, uh, and I think if you embrace light like, like that, or try to understand it like that in terms of the way it does speak. You know, it has rounded tones, it has hard edges. Um, those kinds of descriptors, I think, do help you start to understand what it will do for your photograph, certain kinds of light. Joe, that's awesome. I actually haven't heard that before, but it makes total sense. Like your, your word vocabulary, looking at your adjectives, so you mentally kind of put a label on it. When you walk into a scene, is there sort of a little mental checklist that you go through? Location assessment, uh, I always preach this, is it might end up being the most important thing you do all day outside of go and click, because in this compressed digital world, now people expect you as a photographer to move really fast. You know, what's the first question someone asks when you call them up and say, I want to come over and do your portrait or do your picture, what's the first question they ask? How long is this going to take? I've been in situations in the world of digital where the subject actually walks over to me and, oh, can I see? You know, and looks at the LCD and it's like, well, that's really nice. And there's this instantaneous confirmation. And so, okay, so we're done, right? You know, so sometimes, not always, thankfully, but sometimes that location assessment that you make about where you're going to put the camera, where you're going to put the subject relative to the light is one of, if not the most important decision you make all day because you won't get a second scenario. John Lowengard, who was my director of photography at Life Magazine and a very powerful influence on me, uh, we did an interview together and I was asking him about digital and his, his theory was digital has made us too nice. I was like, what do you mean by that? Hmm. And he, he said, uh, well, you, you know what you got. You know, 30 frames in, 40 frames in, you know what you got. And you just kind of shrug and say, okay, we're, we're good. He said, when you were shooting film, you didn't know what you had. So it pushed you to shoot another role. It pushed you to push your subject. It pushed you to uh, be insistent that, um, well, no, we, you know, I'm really, I got to get another role. I have to do this. I have to, and you would almost badger your subject at that point into some measure of submission that might be actually very truth revealing. His theory was that digital has become this rabbit hole we can run down. Oh, okay, yeah, no, looks good. I got it. Can you lay out that uh 
assessment that you do? The very first thing that I do when I walk into a room, if it's feasible to do this, sometimes it's not, but as I shut off all the artificial light, and I, you know, if there's fluorescent in the ceiling or tungstens on the desk, I just shut everything down. I mean, obviously the room has to have some measure of existing light. You can't be in a coal mine and do this. And then I can just sit there and breathe. And I look around and I just figure out where the light is coming from anyway. And that oftentimes is the key or the grid that you'll have in your head when you start to plot out your own lighting. It really depends on the statement you're trying to make with the photograph. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Greg Heisler. Um, he's a marvelous, marvelous photographer. Uh, I've been a colleague for many years. And his theory, which is very true, it's not a theory, it's an actuality, he says there's basically two kinds of lighting. There's editorial lighting, where you do what I just suggested. You put your lights where the, the light would come from naturally. In other words, you're trying to photograph the pond without causing any ripples. And then, of course, as he says, there's lights, there's light or a style of light where you don't give a rat's ass about reality. You just light it because it looks cool. And that's when the gels come out and the, and the, sh the, the spotlights come out and the rim lights and then this and then that. And you just make something look cool and it's a product more of your imagination illustrating a point or maybe defining a personality in a in a way that you've been assigned to you know say someone is a magician you know for life magazine i i was once assigned to photograph david copperfield the assignment ended up not working out but i started to think of all sorts of fantastical lighting i could bring to that scenario um, but if you're photographing say uh, the grandmother of the year or um, a couple of small children playing well, you're not going to hit them with gels and hard light. You know, you're going to maybe look for something that looks more effortless. When we did our last uh, video, you talked about the idea of embracing your failures. And from the comments, a lot of people felt relief when they saw that, when they heard you saying that, because they kind of thought, wow, if he's willing to fail, I should be willing to fail too. But nonetheless, there is that you know, overcoming of that feeling, which is tough. Do you have any advice for getting past that feeling that you're failing so that you can, you know, use it to springboard off into a success? Get used to it, you know? I mean, um, you know, if you are crushed or feel crushed by failure as a photographer, well, then you're in for a rough time of it because we literally fail every time we take a camera in hand. On some level, you know, maybe not always. Maybe there are jobs which go swimmingly well, you know, and that's like those days when you just think, oh, man, you know, I'm a genius. Um, but then there's a, those days that are a grind. And I find that um, the hard work of photography, the ups and downs of it, the failures of it are very omnipresent. They're always with you. Uh, you know, let's face it, if this was easy to do, <laughs> everybody would do it. There's a lot of pressure associated with jobs and and there's lots of things that can go wrong. This is a very anxiety producing field, you know. I mean, uh, I as I, I say, you know, I don't think your average banker or plumber goes to work every morning looking at the sky and wondering what the if there's going to be good light in the afternoon. We do that. We're like at the window saying, oh, man, I got a job later on. I hope it I hope the light's nice. You know, I mean, that's a very, very slim thing to wish on, <laughs> you know. So um, and so there's so many things that can impact what we do and who we are on a job. And we can fail of no fault of our own subjects late um, lightning storm. Um, car rental breaks down, the agent of the star is a jerk and only gives you three minutes. I mean, you know, there's so many things that can impact um, the very fluid nature of being a photographer. So get used to it. I mean, I, I'd like to be more articulate than that, but, you know, um, failure is with you and failure is a good thing to be with you because it reminds us of how fragile this is. Well, Joe, thank you 
these words mean a lot, not just to me, but I'm sure to the entire community out there. And on that note, thank you, Joe, for joining us. And You're welcome. I want you guys, the audience, I want you to leave your questions and comments down here. I'll, I'll, I'll forward them on to Joe because this is kind of an ongoing conversation we're having here. I encourage you guys to get out and buy a copy of this book. You'll see the eye right here and you'll see the book coming up. A lot of the things I talked with Joe about are actually covered in the book. Visualization, working hard, getting over that idea that you're going to fail, all that stuff that goes on in your head. Move that away and this book actually talks about how to do that. And be sure to subscribe to this video because you're not going to want to miss any of these amazing episodes. And remember to get out and capture your own images of life.